Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conference and uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, there's a big family event going on here this week, unfortunately. Uh, first thing I should mention that the work I'm going to tell you about is in collaboration with uh, uh, three amazing young people, uh, Avrishka Patel, who's now a postdoc at the Flatiron Institute, uh, How You Go, is a, currently a student at Harvard, and Ilya Estlis, who's a postdoc uh, at Harvard and uh, will be joining the faculty in Wisconsin uh, next year. And uh, so we worked on this over the pandemic times, and I think we made a lot of progress. Uh, and uh, there's three papers here that describe the results I'm going to summarize today. Uh, and we continue to work on this. All right, so let me uh, begin, since it's a conference on conformal field theory, talk about a conformal field theory, uh, uh, which is related to the SYK model. It's not quite the SYK model, but it has very similar properties. Uh, and then it turns out to be, uh, you know, the right starting point for generalizing to, to more realistic problems in the uh, corner many body theory. Uh, Okay, and for now, it's uh, the reason for its interest is it's simply the simplest uh, uh, corner many body system that does not have any quasi particle excitations. Uh, so there's a wide class of such models. Uh, basically, you have some fermion psi uh, with some index i and some uh, boson phi with some index l, uh, which extend over m and n values. Uh, and then there's a Yukawa coupling uh, between them, uh, GIJL. Uh, and in all of these problems uh, become solvable in the large n limit uh, if you take this Yukawa coupling to be uh, just uh, un uh, uncorrelated random numbers. Um, and then things become solvable. Uh, so this is very similar to the SYK models. We just have fermions uh, and a four index random coupling, but here you have a three index random coupling. Uh, actually, uh, the idea to look at such models uh, came up in a conversation with uh, with uh, David Agayoto at lunchtime in the Perimeter Institute uh, when he was interested in finding supersymmetric versions, which we did find in this paper. But since then, many other people have looked at such models uh, and uh, without supersymmetry. Okay, so in the large end limit, what's very interesting about these models uh, is that the so-called migdal Eliashberg equations, uh, which are schematically written here, that the self-energy of the fermion is the product of the full leader normalized Green's function uh, of the fermion times the Green's function of the boson, and the self-energy of the boson uh, is just the product of two Green's functions of the fermion. Uh, these become exact in the larger limit. So this is really the first time that we can now write down a saddle point uh, whose uh, saddle point equation, uh, a functional integral whose saddle point equations are the big dial elastic equations, and in principle, even uh, address uh, fluctuations uh, beyond the mid dial solution. Um, and also, these models are simple enough that you can even sol solve them numerically uh, by exact diagonalization or by Corner Monte Carlo. Uh, and all of that's been done. And really, there's a very complete understanding. Uh, of the kind of non-Fermi liquids you get on these and many other similar models. One, I'll just describe one such model. Uh, this is from the paper of Estelis and uh, Ilya Estelis and Georg Schmalian. Uh, in this case, you uh, have no dispersion at all in the fermions. They all have the same energy. And all the oscillators also have the same frequency, omega zero, so a bunch of Einstein oscillators. Uh, and then you have these three index random tensor that couples the fermions and the bosons. Uh, and now you can set up a path integral, take the large end limit, uh, and these are the full uh, cycle point equations, which are also the migdal and aspect equations for this problem. Uh, at the moment, I'm taking G to be complex, uh, and this is the full story. Uh, if you take G to be real, then they can also be superconducting states. Uh, appearing uh, actually in a manner quite similar to what Sung Sik just described, uh, but I won't go into that. Um, all right, so these equations uh, can be solved analytically in the low frequency limit. Uh, and what you find uh, is that both the Green's function have some anomalous power law, uh, which is determined by this uh, number delta, 
which for consistency has to be in this range. Um, and then you just plug in these equations, do a little bit of complex analysis, uh, and you find uh, an equation for delta. Uh, so that's the value of delta for this particular model, where the number of bosons and number of fermions is equal. If you make them proportional to each other uh, with a uh, arbitrary constant, then you can tune this uh, parameter continuously. Okay, so so that's the the state without any uh, quasi-particle excitations, uh, and it's some quantum many-body states, and it has a, a lot of interesting properties, uh, which when you uh, think about them, actually are closer to to physical properties of black holes than any uh, condensed matter system that uh, you would find generically. Uh, and so here are some of the properties. Uh, my talk is really about uh, making this more realistic. So I won't have time to go into all of this. Let me just summarize. So it turns out at very low energies, uh, there's an emergent conformal symmetry. This is, it has no space dimension, so it's in zero plus one dimensions. Uh, the conformal group in zero plus one dimensions, uh, if you just continue it from, uh, from higher dimension, it's SL2R. So there's an SL2R symmetry. Uh, there's also the, that's the global conformal symmetry, but there's a local conformal symmetry in which this case is just the time parameterization. Uh, and here there's a, a very unusual phenomenon, which was pointed out by, uh, uh, I guess, Kitev and Maldacena uh, and uh, Stanford and others, uh, that there's a time parameterization soft mode. That is that when you go to very low frequencies, in particular frequencies which become the inverse of the system size, uh, then this mode becomes strongly coupled. So this is what you would call a dangerously relevant perturbation, but it's only dangerously relevant uh, at very low frequencies, you know, and not in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, and this breaks uh, conformal symmetry. Uh, and so all of these, these, these basic properties are actually quite universal properties of conformal field theories, uh, in zero plus one dimensions. Uh, and they are also universal properties of, uh, black holes, charged black holes, which have a ADS2 near horizon. And the simplest way to see that connection, uh, is that the isometric group of ADS2 is also, uh, SL2R. Uh, now, ADS2 by itself turns out to be, if you take quantum gravity and just a pure ADS2, it's kind of trivial. Uh, so you really have to think about the embedding of ADS2 in some higher dimensional space. Uh, so there's some SD. So if you take a charged black hole in four space-time dimension, there'll be an S2. Uh, and then there's a boundary. If you go, if you're very near the black hole, very near the horizon, uh, then the geometry is ADS2 cross S2. Uh, but when you go far away from the horizon, you get some other geometry. Uh, and the crossover region, or there's a boundary layer. And in the boundary layer, there's a boundary graviton. And this boundary graviton is nothing but the same time representation mode that's present in the model that I've just described. Uh, and there's also a connection to pure gravity in two dimensions, and that's the so-called JT gravity theory. Anyway, okay, so that could take many talks. and. Uh, some of this is reviewed in this paper that's about to appear in reviews of modern physics. And as also briefly mentioned, this is a phase diagram from this paper. Um, you can also look for superconducting instabilities and uh, they can even be superconducting states under suitable conditions. Uh, in this case, you know, the same issue that Sunsik mentioned, depending on parameters, uh, the region of non fermi liquid behavior could be rather small compared to superconductivity, but you can expand that by playing around with some of the parameters. Okay. All right. So now let me, uh, so with that uh, quick uh, introduction uh, to a solvable set of models, which are now, you know, almost completely understood, uh, let's try to get to something uh, more realistic. Uh, and, you know, that's again been a a focus of much work in the last uh, five, five, ten years or so, and many different directions have tried, have been tried, um, and I think we've learned a lot from that. And uh, I'm going to present to you what I think I believe is the is the best way to generalize the physics of the SYK model to something much more realistic. Okay. Um, all right, but before I get there, let me just define some of these terms that are often used interchangeably and sometimes not entirely consistently. Uh, so, but I'm going to define them uh, 
in a few slides, uh, a non-Fermi liquid, a marginal Fermi liquid, and a strange metal, uh, then distinct things, distinct states of matter, uh, and uh, uh, and um, well, there could be have, there could be a state of matter which have more than one of these properties, but they refer to distinct properties. Uh, and uh, uh, I think Sunsik also probably uses a slightly different definition from what I'm going to use. Uh, but like Sunsik, let's just consider uh, the basic problem, which is a Fermi surface uh, in two dimensions, a Fermi on psi uh, coupled to some boson phi. So in the Yukawa SYK model, the boson was just a dispersionless oscillator, but now we're going to give it some dispersion uh, and some kinetic, bare kinetic energy. Uh, and if this is an order parameter of some broken symmetry, there's even a tuning parameter that's going to tune uh, the mass of this boson. Um, so, so phi, depending on the physical situation, could be pneumatic order, ferromagnetic order, uh, Sangsik talked about the case with antiferromagnetic order when you have hot spots. Uh, ultimately, the physics I'm going to describe also, I think, applies to this case, but I'm going to focus, let's just focus on the simplest one, uh, which is the pneumatic order parameter. So in this case, you know, as you tune the mass of the boson, there can be a state where uh, the boson uh, is not condensed, which is the ordinary Fermi liquid, or they can be a state where it's condensed, and then this order parameter measures the square symmetry of the system. So it's like a structural lattice order parameter. And when it condenses, there's two possible choices. The Fermi surface can distort into this rectangular form uh, in two possible ways. So there's a quantum critical point, and you would then expect a quantum critical region where the quantum physics of this uh, critical point that uh, similar to the one that Sensik was describing will be very important. So we'd love to know what are the properties uh, of the state of matter in this regime. Uh, there will also be a phase transition at finite temperature here, uh, but that uh, is essentially described by the 2D Ising model in this case, uh, at least the uh, thermodynamic properties. Uh, our interest really is here where we have to worry about the zero temperature uh, critical point. Um, so what do we do? Uh, well, we take uh, the fermions and the bosons and you couple them together. And in this case, you know, uh, ignoring certain form factors, just for simplicity, uh, there's a simple Yukawa coupling, psi dagger psi phi coupling G. Um, and so this problem is not precisely the one Sang Sangsik talked about, but uh, you know, Sangsik has done some very beautiful work on this problem also. Uh, and there's been a huge amount of work, uh, but uh, you know all of it roughly coming to the same conclusion, uh, which was already made uh, by Patrick Lee in 1889, uh, early on. You just uh, essentially look at the big dial Lilyashvili type analysis, and what you find is that the self energy is omega to the two thirds. Uh, so that's more singular than the bare omega in the Green's function. So the Green's function has an epsilon of k. Uh, and then the self-energy, which vanishes omega to the two-thirds. Uh, so at the Fermi surface, where the epsilon of k is zero, uh, then this Green's function is not so different from the Yukawa SYK model. The exponent here is two-thirds, and there it was something else that you can vary by changing the number of bosons and fermions. Here, you can't do that. Uh, the number is always just two-thirds, at least in this uh, uh, leading order analysis that many people have uh, performed. Uh, the boson propagator has a Q squared and this very singular Landau damping factor uh, that comes from the presence of the Fermi surface. Uh, the other thing to emphasize is that there's a perfectly sharp Fermi surface uh, in the system, even though the quasi particles are not well defined. The Fermi surface is just the zero uh, of epsilon. Uh, at zero frequency, where the imaginary part of uh, self-energy vanishes. Uh, and, and so the Fermi surface is very sharp, even though the quasi-particles aren't. So, all right, so, so that's a basic state of matter, which I will now call a non-Fermi liquid. So here, let me just define these things now. So if I had, if I go back to this Green's function here, the self-energy in a Fermi liquid goes omega squared, so you would then say that a quasi-particle with energy epsilon would have a lifetime, which is one over uh, epsilon squared. 
so you have the basic property of a Fermi liquid, whoops, uh, that the inverse lifetime, which is one epsilon squared, is much smaller than the energy. Uh, and also the basic, another basic property of Fermi liquid is that there's a density of states, uh, momentum integrated density of states, just a constant uh, as epsilon uh, goes to zero. Okay, so what's a non-Fermi liquid then? The non-Fermi liquid is the opposite case uh, where the spectral function has the property uh, that one over tau of E is much bigger than E. And in this case, it's uh, epsilon to the two thirds uh, and uh, that's much bigger than E as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, uh, so, the, so the electrons are not no, non quasi particles, and it's believed there's no other composite object that remains a quasi particle uh, in this non Fermi liquid. Uh, in a contrast, in one dimension, in a Luttinger liquid, uh, the electron quasi particle fails, but there are other quasi particles present, which are just the uh, bosonic modes of a Luttinger liquid. Uh, but here, there's no such analog. Okay, and the marginal Fermi liquid is the case just between them where one of tau of E is of order E. Um, and uh, this will uh, also appears in models of this type in certain cases uh, and also play an important role in uh, what I'm gonna talk about. So, so far I've been describing these uh, metallic states of matter by just looking at a Green's function by single particle properties. But when you go to experiments, they are actually, you know, they measure, people do measure single particle properties, uh, but predominantly they measure transport properties, which is really a, a very different thing. Uh, and that difference is really the key to everything in my talk. Uh, so in the cuprates, we have a regime that I'm going to call a strange metal, uh, which appears above uh, the highest, you know, above the peak in the, top of the superconducting dome over some temperature range. Uh, and this strange metal has many uh, remarkable properties. Uh, one of which is the resistance uh, is linear in temperature uh, over a very wide range uh, under condition where the resistivity is extremely small. And in some cases by applying a magnetic field, you can go down to you know, the lowest temperatures. Uh, so that's the famous linear to resistivity in, uh, in a cuprate from a recent measurement. Uh, also, quite remarkably, uh, this is twisted bilayer graphene, where you again have a superconducting dome. The scales here are much smaller. And now you can see again above the superconducting dome or near it, uh, you see a linear to resistivity over a wide range of temperatures, uh, again with a very small uh, resistivity. Okay, so let's just use that to be the defining property of a strange metal, uh, that the resistance is linear in temperature, and also the resistivity, the overall resistivity is very small, which H over E squared. Uh, there's another phrase you might somewhere hear, people calling it bad metals, that's the case where resistivity is bigger than H over E squared. Uh, the theory of those is in much better shape, but it's not as universal as I'm going to claim the theory uh, of the strange metals. So I'm going to restrict myself to talk about strange metal as defined by transport and thermodynamics. So as emphasized in this very nice recent article by Sean Hartnell and Andy McKinsey, uh, this is a very universal property as is the specific heat. Uh, Sangsik briefly mentioned this, specific heat is going as T goes as T log T. And another recent paper also claimed a degree of universality in very in superconductivity in strange metals in the optical conductivity. So the resistivity is the inverse of the DC conductivity, sigma of zero. Optical conductivity you would measure uh, in some kind of uh, laser experiment in the infrared, uh, and it's characterized by uh, you know this is basically the roughly the Drude formula. The Drude formula has a time tau and an effective mass m star, uh, but absolutely key to everything I'm gonna talk about is unlike the Drude formula, the m star and tau are not single particle properties. They're not something you would deduce from the single particle Green's function. Uh, these are something, uh, in, you know, in the Drude theory they are, and most Fermi liquid, they're almost the same thing. 
In fact, in many cases, they're almost the same thing. And we've got so accustomed to them being equal uh, that people often just assume they're equal, but really they're not. They're very different quantities. And in a strange metal, as you'll see, they're very, you know, that's really crucial. So anyway, if you take the conductivity and you measure this scattering time tau, which I'll call tau transport, uh, and the effective mass m star, uh, then this recent paper has argued that actually many, many materials all have the same basic property, uh, especially the cuprates, and that the, the time, the transport time, uh, well, when omega is smaller than t, it's just kt, uh, and when omega is much bigger than t, it's omega. So the g is some function that goes from uh, linearly proposed to t to linearly proposed to omega. Uh, okay, so that's the behavior. And you, uh, in fact, I have some experimental data here showing you the scaling behavior of one over tau as a function of omega over kt. Uh, now, because of this uh, linear omega dependence, uh, there is, however, a kramers chronic relationship between these two quantities. And because of this linear dependence in the imaginary part, there's a log dependence in M star. And that's also seen. Uh, and that log can sometimes appear as a as a anomalous power law, has been interpreted as a different power law. Uh, but uh, Michaud and all argued that really this is the most simplest way of interpreting a whole a variety of data. All right, so then this is my definition of a strange, uh, strange metal uh, as observed experiment. This is what's seen. And so what I'm going to propose is a, is a theory which actually has all of these properties and just pops right out as the basic properties of the state of matter I'm going to talk about. All right, so now let's get to, to theories. So I talked about the zero dimensional toy model uh, but we want to go beyond that. We want to be in two dimensions uh, and not deal with toy models and make it as realistic as possible. Uh, but what we did learn from the toy models that it really pays to have a large N expansion. Uh, it really helps you uh, organize the perturbation theory in a sensible way. And then you can also then, uh, uh, you know, talk about fluctuations, connection to gravity, whatnot. So, you know, we absolutely need some some control. Okay, uh, you know, Sangsi gave a very beautiful talk where the control was the angle between uh, the Fermi surface of the hotspots. Here, I'm going to take a large n approach. Okay, all right. So first of all, let me take the problem I've just described, which is the Fermi surface coupled to a critical boson. Take exactly that problem uh, with no spatial disorder, uh, which is what I had. Um, so that, as uh, you know, widely believed, is a non-Fermi liquid, and uh, and yeah, that's correct. And I'll give you a large N theory where you get basically the same non-Fermi liquid. Uh, but a careful study of that theory tells us that it, in fact, cannot be the explanation of the data. It's not a strange metal. All right, um, and in, in and it differs in a really big way, as I'll show you. Okay, so here's the, the basic theory that I've just talked about. Uh, free fermions of the Fermi surface, a boson, and a Yukawa coupling between them. Okay, so what we want to do is uh, first take a large n limit. Uh, I should say there were large n studies of this uh, where people just took the fermions to have n flavors, uh, and, uh, and then Sangsik showed that that theory didn't work either. Uh, so what we're going to do, inspired by the Yukawa SYK model, uh, is to take both the fermions and the bosons to have n flavors, but make the uh, uh, the coupling a random function of the flavor index. Okay, so that's really the uh, the thing that you're borrowing from the Yukawa SYK model. Now you might say, well, that's you're introducing. This is a different problem. Uh, admittedly, that's correct. Uh, but the hope here is that Ultimately, there's some universal IR physics. Um, and in the space of coupling constants, maybe there's some fixed point, nice fixed point, with, to which many different bare couplings flow. So you might as well average over the bare theories because they all have the same IR properties. Uh, so that's roughly the basic idea. Uh, and this idea is being, you know, being used to study strongly coupled conformal field theories in two dimensions uh, also 
and explore their connections to gravity. Uh, anyway, I, there will be no connection to gravity. That's still an open problem for these, this, uh, this system. Uh, but let me just go ahead and look at this problem. So you just take the large n equations. Uh, notice, however, you have perfect translational symmetry. All the other symmetries of the problem, conservation of charge, translations, square lattice symmetry, they're all preserved. All right, so if you take the large n limit, you get the same migdal and hatchback equations uh, that had been written down earlier. Uh, now there's an extra spatial and momentum index, so that just makes them harder to solve. Uh, but anyway, these uh, also can be solved in the low energy limit, and uh, this is something that uh, Ilya has checked numerically by solving these equations here without further approximation. Uh, and there's a self-energy that, you know, as I already said, goes on make it a two-thirds. So you just reproduce the old answer, uh, except now you have uh, some way of organizing uh, the corrections and at least talking about one over n corrections to this theory. I'm not going to do that because that's really much, much harder than the SYK model and hasn't really been done. It'd be nice to do that. Uh, I'm going to stick at n equals infinity and talk about transport. So, so here, you know, the large n expansion, you know, is kind of foolproof. It tells you exactly which graphs you have to consider to compute transport. You're computing a current current correlation functions, and these are the lowest order graphs, and you have to sum an infinite set of them. Um, again, these are very similar to the kind of graphs you have to consider uh, for the SYK model when you're talking about energy correlation functions or OTOX or something like that. Uh, but here they have both uh, in momentum and frequency indices, not just frequency like in the SYK model. So in fact, exactly these graphs were analyzed by Kim et al. in a well-known paper, uh, and they concluded that resistivity is d to the four thirds uh, analog of uh, thick, if you had the electron phonon system, uh, you would just get Bloch's law for the electron phonon and just do did Bloch's calculation for this case and goes d to the four third, and an optical conductivity that goes as omega uh, to the minus two third. Okay, uh, now uh, now both of these conclusions are actually not correct. So uh, and that's something that has become clear over the years. Uh, but the calculation that went into, you know, this, this, the, cal the methods that went into these computations had been, you know, used by many, many people. Uh, presumably, you know, uh, because of the success of Bloch's law. So let me argue why, why is it that, you know, Bloch's law uh, is really should be used with caution. So for the so block originally came up with this theory in 1931. He was considering the scattering of electrons of phonons. Um, and he just assumes the phonons are some thermal distribution function and then looks at uh, how the electrons relax if you set up an electrical current in the thermal bath of phonons. Okay, and when you do that, you get t to the fifth. I mean, basically it's essentially a Fermi's golden rule type calculation. Uh, but very soon afterwards, Parles pointed out that actually this calculation is not really right at low temperatures. Uh, and the reason is that at very low temperatures, the lattice doesn't really matter. The umklaut processes don't happen. You're just looking at acoustic phonons at very low momentum. Uh, and in that case, the total momentum of the electron plus phonon system is conserved. Uh, and this means, in fact, if you just had a perfectly pure crystal, at very low temperatures, the resistance uh, may well be exponentially small. Uh, it's just practically zero in a pure sample. Uh, but when people did experiments, they found t to the fifth works. And this is in three dimensions. This thing is t to the fourth and fourth. It <laughs> blocks calculation, even though wrong, agrees with experiments. Uh, and why is that? Well, the reason is that, uh, well, there's two things. First of all, no crystal is ever pure. There's always impurities. And second, the electron phonon coupling is weak. So a phonon, if, you, if an electron emits a phonon, uh, that phonon will see an impurity before it ever sees another electron. Uh, so we just dump its momentum on an impurity. Uh, and so you can just forget about momentum conservation. It's only recently in some very pure crystals, uh, beautiful work by Andy McKinsey, uh, that this effect that Pyle pointed out uh, has been seen. Uh, 
as you see, the resistance become much smaller and controlled by the size of the crystal rather than anything else. However, in a non-Fermi liquid, uh, this whole idea of Brock is really meaningless because it requires you to separate the momentum carried by the fermions and the bosons. But in fact, in a non-Fermi liquid, neither of them really exist. There's only a, a soup of <laughs> uh, many body states, as you've learned from the SYK model. They don't really exist as separate entities. So to talk about their momentum as separate makes no sense. Uh, so really, they're dragging each other along. And uh, in a pure system, block law simply does not apply. OK, so that's a very basic physical point. Uh, so you know these conclusions did not probably account for conservation of total momentum, at least at very low temperatures. OK, so what do you get in this theory? Uh, well, in fact, you know they had the right graphs. You just had to evaluate them a bit more carefully. Uh, and uh, and if you evaluate these carefully, you find, first of all, uh, this particular problem, the resistance is zero uh, at low temperature. Uh, in fact, this conductivity is just a delta function. Uh, so this is actually a perfect metal. Uh, so it may be a non-Fermi liquid, but it's really a, it's really a perfect metal. Uh, and more recently, it's become clear that uh, even the omega to the minus two third doesn't work, uh, even though the self energy being omega to two third is perfectly fine. Uh, the conductivity is infinite, and even doesn't the optical conductivity doesn't have an omega to the two third tail. It's just a delta. The real part of the conductivity is just a delta function. Of course, there are corrections when you take large momentum processes, but those corrections will be just like in a Fermi liquid. All right, so that's the conclusion. Uh, if you have no spatial disorder, it's easy to get non-Fermi liquids, but by my definition, that's not a strange metal. I mean, it's a perfect metal, actually. Okay, so now, so we have to break translational symmetry in some way. Now, there have been a few papers uh, by Erez Berg and very nice one and Patrick Lee, which said, well, let's think about Umklap uh, scattering. Uh, there's also Chubukov and Maslow, where they talked about compensated materials with uh, um, you know, both the electron and hole like Fermi surfaces. Uh, yeah, those old mechanisms will work, but, uh, you know, they require special circumstances that are not present in the cuprates. Uh, and, uh, you know, for the umklap mechanism requires some fine tuning, uh, whereas the strange metal phenomenology seems to be very general and not particularly relying on any special feature. Okay, so what's generic is there's always some impurities. So let's just put in some impurities. So there, uh, so there. Yes. So, so yes. Before, before you go there, so, so can I ask you about this uh, uh, drag question in general? So so basically uh, for the non from liquid, if we do the epsilon expansion, for example, we can make the uh, system potentially flow to a, a coupling constant at order epsilon. So when epsilon is very small, can we say that the electron and this both boson field, they also couple very weak, so can we use the, uh, you know? No, I mean, you have to have impurities in the end. If, you're, sure, if, sure, you're, sure. if, you, if your crystal yeah. is, uh, if your crystal is pure, then no matter how small the coupling, there's always drag. Yeah, I know, I know. So, so, so I'm saying that, uh, so, so at least uh, when, the, when the Fermi and the boson coupling constant is very weak, can we say that uh, uh, what would be expected by doing the uh, similar calculation as we done before, you know, it's still okay as long as the uh, momentum of the system gets relaxed through the interaction between the boson and the impurity. The boson does not give the momentum back to the fermion. Yeah, yeah, coupling. you could say that. I mean, I, I should that. say the, you know, the calculation that people did uh, was completely fine. You know, if you did the, the graphs they were looking at completely fine. They just didn't uh, carefully look at the, the fact that this, Actually, the, the, this graph canceled with this graph. This was something they should have noticed, but they didn't notice. Uh, the cal the, the cal everything was fine. If they just been a little more careful, they would have seen that the conductivity is zero. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think uh, I you know these are not these are very smart people, and uh, I, I think they probably had a justification like the one you're mentioning. But uh, I think with, uh, we want to do better now. We want to really understand the role of disorder in a much more cleaner way. Okay, uh, so uh, so let's add some uh, potential disorder. Okay, and what we're going to see 
uh, is this gets us halfway there. As far as the electron properties are concerned, you get a marginal Fermi liquid. Uh, this is something that actually was known before, uh, but it's not a, still not a strange metal. So I'm going to, it's very important to distinguish a marginal Fermi liquid from a strange metal, uh, even though as far as, you know, uh, the relaxation time tau is concerned, they they have a similar behavior. You know, a marginal Fermi liquid, the single particle relaxation time is linearly proportional temperature. Uh, in a strange metal, the transport relaxation time, relaxation rate is linearly proportional temperature. Uh, but as we'll see <laughs> that in this particular model, the single particle time is linearly proportional to temperature, but the but the transport time is not. Sorry, rate, not time. Okay, so what are we going to do? We take our old theory uh, and we add a random potential V of R to the to the electrons. I mean, this is the basic, you know, the basis of what you always do in the theory of disordered Fermi liquids. Uh, if you didn't have the critical boson, this particular theory with short train interactions is highly successful. Uh, in the theory of disordered Fermi liquids. Okay, so V of R is some uh, random potential, but notice this delta function. Uh, so this is where the spatial randomness comes in. It's uncorrelated at different points in space. Okay, um, so now uh, I want to take the larger limit of this problem. So I, I in all the indices, and I put in indices on Vij. Uh, but now the, the the crucial distinction between the disorder between the randomness here and the randomness here is that this thing has only the orbital I mean these these flavor indices where this has an extra delta function. So this tells you that this thing really this delta function is what breaks translational symmetry, uh, and so should give you um, some hope of getting uh, you know at least some interesting properties in the transport. Uh, it's not completely decided by momentum conservation. Okay. Uh, all right. So, but now you can just turn the crank, uh, just like we did for the SYK model, uh, and look at the saddle point equation. You get a set of Migdal and Iceberg equations. You can solve them. Uh, and what do you find? So now you'll find that the boson propagate at criticality has a diffusive form. Uh, it's not omega over Q, it's just omega. So this is, this is dynamic exponent because Z equals two. Uh, with this gamma, of course, uh, depends in some singular way on the uh, on the scattering rate omega. So we're now at the very lowest scattering rate uh, v. We're now at the very lowest frequencies where the boson propagator has just become diffusive. Okay. And then you put this into the self-energy, uh, and you get two terms. Uh, first, this is just the Drew de scattering, uh, which you, you know learn in solid state physics 101 is just uh, Fermi's golden rule. The scattering rate is V squared times the density of state and gives you an imaginary part uh, of the self energy. So if the Drude theory would be only have this term. But because of this boson, you get a term proportional G squared uh, and then a V squared in the denominator from the V squared dependence of gamma, uh, which is this marginal Fermi liquid form. So if you were now to take the imaginary part of this for real frequencies, you would get a uh, uh, scattering rate, which is linearly proportional to temperature. Uh, so, so that's you know, uh, that's good. Uh, and so you have a marginal Fermi liquid self energy, and also you get the T log T specific heat that's observed. So, you know, that looked very promising. Uh, but now we go ahead and do the same calculation for the conductivity uh, in this uh, in this theory. Um, and you uh, and you find something which I guess you could have expected that uh, this g squared log term, uh, which gave you a marginal Fermi liquid behavior in the self energy, does not contribute in the transport. It just cancels out. Basically, there's a cancellation, if I remember right, uh, between this graph and this graph. Uh, and this cancellation again is uh, due to momentum conservation. Uh, the even though there's disorder in the single particle self energy, the inelastic processes that are responsible for the temperature dependencies are completely momentum conserving, uh, and so they just cancel out. And so, in fact, all you get is the Drew to answer. Rho of zero is one over uh, is proportional to uh, tau transport. That's a, uh, and the tau transport 
uh, is the same as the Drudo value, which is uh, oops, Drudo value, which is this this term over here. So this this term here in Drudo theory uh, gives you the resistivity. So that's and and the corrections to this go as t squared, just like in any Fermi liquid. So so this is now a state of matter where you have a disorder due to uh, acting on the fermions, uh, which is what you start with in any theory of disordered uh, metals. Uh, but that, you know, softens the uh, critical behavior. It's no longer a non-Fermi liquid, but it's a marginal Fermi liquid. Uh, but the transport is not that of a strange metal. All right. So, so that's another failure. So finally, uh, I have, yeah, okay. So I'm going to now come to the main point of the talk. What we want to do is to take this model uh, and put disorder in a different place. You have to put disorder in the interaction itself. And that will turn out to really be a very promising description and really fit many experimental uh, uh, indications. And, you know, what, the thing I like most about this theory in a way is that it's a very simple general theory. It applies to almost any quantum critical point you can think of, uh, and uh, including the spin density wave case that uh, Sangsik mentioned, although I won't discuss that here. Uh, and uh, and that's, you know, in keeping with the phenomenology. The phenomenology is also uh, you know, surprisingly general. So we really need a simple universal explanation. So we're going to propose one. Okay, so the key uh, is uh, randomness in the interactions themselves. So why should there be randomness in interaction? Well, first of all, from experiments, we see this all the time. If you, for example, this is one ST, set of STM measurements recently by uh, the Leiden group. Uh, they're measuring the, the superconducting gap. Uh, with some, uh, you know, angstrom resolution in at uh, three different densities, uh, and if you just pick, you know, even the optimally doped system here, uh, the gap value, you know, mean value at any point is nine millivolts, uh, but it goes all the way from three to fifteen. And these are, you know, clean samples. There's quite a large variation in the interaction strength uh, in the SAS system uh, over, you know, tens of angstroms or so. Uh, and uh, so this kind of variation, the gap, which is clearly determined by some microscopic interaction strength, means that it's not just the potential or the wave function of the electron that was, that's disordered, but it's also the interactions between them. Okay, so let's try to imagine, you know, so another way to see this is that if, if the potential is disordered, so there's a disorder in the hopping of the electrons, then in strong decorated system, the interactions, you know, go as t squared over u. Uh, and so the J's are also random. Okay. So we imagine that, you know, the phi mode is, is you know, something that came out of uh, some, uh, it's not a microscopic field. It's uh, you know, ultimately your, everything is electrons. So you have some interaction, which now depends on space. And I'm suppressing the relative coordinates and form factors here, only the central mass coordinate, V of R. Uh, and this is some random function. Uh, you know, it varies. Let's say it always has the same sign, but it, it varies a little bit. Okay, so now how do you get the field phi? You get it by some kind of uh, Hubbard Stratonovich decoupling. So if you decouple this interaction, you would say this is phi squared over 2j times phi psi dagger psi. Okay, so now what we see is that there's a, the interaction is in the mass of the boson. So it's as if the critical point of the system is varying from point to point. Okay, so so initially, so you can put the disorder in this term, and and you if you do the usual analysis, you find this is strongly relevant. It just flows off to infinity, and you just then you have to throw up your hands and say, what do you do? Okay, uh, so uh, so here's what you do. So the idea here is that this is so important that you really should account for the random mass before you even begin. Uh, and the simplest way to do it is to rescale your field phi. So you have, since the phi is not a microscopic field, you have a little freedom in how you define it. So you rescale phi by square root of j, basically. Uh, and when you do that, the random mass disappears, and it appears instead uh, in the Yukawa coupling. Okay, so uh, so this is sort of like a redundant operator, and I think you do it in other conformal field theories too. 
uh, you take a, uh, you know, some very relevant operator and by just redefining a field, you put it somewhere else where you get uh, put it under control. So you put it here in the Yukawa coupling. And so now this thing will have some non-zero mean, but it'll also have some spatial variation. And that turns out, you know, according to us, to be the absolutely the most important thing to keep this term in there. So now we want to put in, we take, we took care of the random mass and transferred it into a random coupling. Uh, and now, so this is the theory we want to consider. Uh, you have a Yukawa coupling, which is G plus G prime. Um, and G prime has zero mean uh, and is disordered. So it has this delta function correlate. We still have the random potential if you want. Uh, and so there it is. So that's the model we would like to solve. Uh, but we can only solve it in the large end limit. So we put all these indices. Uh, and then you have this G prime coupling uh, whose root mean square value is G prime squared. And there's a delta function here. So these are the two spatial disorder terms. Um, and uh, that's just the ordinary Yukawa term. All right, so now you go ahead and uh, uh, I realize I should. Uh, you go ahead and you uh, solve the saddle point equations. So now you find that uh, uh, you have a, a G term, G squared or V squared, as we had before in the boson polarization. Uh, and then you have a G prime squared, which is also a mod omega. And so the boson is still remains uh, diffusive. So it's exactly the same form as just with the V term. Uh, and then uh, the fermion self-energy uh, now has three contributions. There was the V contribution we had before. There was a G, con G squared contribution that we had before. This is the marginal Fermi liquid behavior. This is the uh, uh, Judo behavior. And now you have the G prime term, which also turns out to be, well, no surprise since it had the same mod omega here to be marginal Fermi liquid. So now there's two different sources of the marginal Fermi liquid self energy, one from G and one from G prime. That of course is the key. So now you go ahead and evaluate the conductivity uh, and lo and behold, since this doesn't conserve cons uh, conserve momentum, uh, the naive idea that uh, an, a scattering time of the electron will become a transport scattering time holds for G prime, but does not hold for G as we already show. Okay, so that's what happens uh, when you compute the conductivity, the G squared log term just cancel, uh, but the G prime squared log term does not. And so that does contribute to the transport and gives you finally what we've been trying to get, a resistivity that's linear in temperature. Uh, okay, and in fact, you can do the, up, in fact, what we do actually do the explicit calculation we have done so far analytically is in the optical conductivity and you get exactly the form that I'd written down earlier where the tau transport, one over tau transport has two contributions. Uh, one is uh, the Druda contribution from the random potential. And then there's a G prime squared contribution uh, that gives you a one over omega tail in the optical conductivity uh, exactly as is observed. And the effective mass as is log omega dependence that of course had to come from the Kramers chronic transform of this. Uh, and uh, so, so the residual resistivity, so this is, so what we find in the end is this two important and distinct sources of disorder. One is the V squared, which is the usual term, and that just determines the residual resistivity. The other is the G prime squared, and that determines the linear T resistivity. So they're really determined by very different physical inputs. And this hopefully can account for the fact that sometimes, depending on the experiment, you can change the residual resistivity without changing the slope of the uh, uh, linear T resistivity or vice versa. Some, sometimes you can, uh, it just depends on which particular experiment you're looking at. But that's something we want to understand better. What is the microscopic? origin of G prime and what is the microscopic origin of V. Okay, so here's the full solution of the migdal elastic equations. And you do indeed find resistivity, which is linear in temperature uh, and uh, one over top omega going is omega. Okay. All right, to summarize then, uh, I think I'm almost done. Uh, so Fermi surface coupled to a critical boson with no spatial disorder. 
is a non-fermi liquid, but not a strange metal, a non-fermi liquid in a single particle self-energy. A Fermi surface coupled to critical boson uh, with the potential disorder is a marginal Fermi liquid. So the single particle scattering rate is linearly proportional to temperature, but it's not a strange metal. Uh, the transport scattering rate is goes as T squared, just like in a Fermi liquid. Uh, but if you put in interaction disorder, then you get what you always wanted and which is seen in you know, many, many systems, a marginal Fermi liquid in the so uh, electron self energy and a strange metal in the transport. Uh, okay, so just to summarize again, so this is the full theory. You have a Fermi surface of electrons. There's a critical boson. There's very there's three different terms. There's a G, a V, and a G prime. If you just had the G, then you get a non-Fermi liquid, but nothing in the conductivity. Uh, if you had the G and the V, you get a T log T specific heat and a marginal Fermi liquid. Uh, but just uh, uh, a Fermi liquid-like behavior in the residual resistivity and the optical conductivity. And only when you add the G prime, you get uh, everything that's seen. Okay, uh, in the larger limit. Now, of course, beyond the larger limit, you know, once you have one type of disorder, you're going to get other types of disorder. And exactly how that happens uh, is something we want to study better. All right, to summarize then, so what inspired this work after many years of uh, understanding many, many details of the SYK model. Uh, and we've learned, you know, some very useful lessons. And uh, so it's you know, important lesson is always good to have a solvable model of what you're studying, in particular, a solvable model of a system without quasi-particles. Uh, and from that, we have a universal theory of a marginal Fermi liquid and a strange metal. Uh, and, and the key is the spatially random interaction. Uh, I should say, you know, I believe that the spatial random interaction is the most important thing. The fact we're taking a larger limit, you know, that's a technical tool. Uh, so it'd be nice to study these spatially random systems uh, by quantum Monte Carlo at n equals one, and let's see what happens. So, uh, you know, so I'm, I imagine people will be doing that. I think Avishka has already been, have some code for that running. So we'll see, we'll be able to at least assess how accurate the larger limit is. And uh, this is not something I talked about, but uh, rather surprisingly, the same sort of ideas here, starting from the SYK model and using random interactions, uh, have played a big role uh, in understanding, uh, you know, quantum information in black holes and black hole evaporation. Uh, a lot of it also related, in, uh, especially in the work by Saad Shankar and Stanford. Uh, to uh, to random matrix theories of various types, uh, which are connected to the SYK model. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sabir, for a very intriguing talk. Time for questions. Yeah, so uh, so yeah. in, the, in the last part, so when you uh, go from the random, random mass disorder to random Yukawa coupling, so yes. there, there uh, you rescale the boson field, but the, at, at the end of the day, um uh, the boson has is tuned to criticality so does does that uh, require tuning the space dependent mass um no it's not tuned to criticality um uh, you just have to make it spatially uniform that's all you could still have a mass for the boson as long as it's spatially uniform the the, the <laughs> motivation that's strongly relevant that we want to take uh, is the spatial dependence of course the the mass is always relevant that we have to tune to be at the critical point. Does that require tuning the space dependent mass? Well, I mean, for example, here I've scaled it, uh, scaled it to this value two. I mean, it's not massless here. Uh, uh, I just put the J over here. So there's some arbitrariness, but you uh, scale it and you can scale it to any value you want. Uh, but you, you take the spatial dependence and you put it over here. Can you see my arrow? Actually, I forgot. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. But after you rescale the boson field in a space-dependent way, yes. now you will you know, generate some grad phi squared. You will generate additional terms. Yeah, yeah. In the, but those are so. But you can then see that the spatial dependence uh, in the grad phi squared term is not in, is irrelevant when you work that out. Yeah. So there's a bit of hand waving here, but <laughs> this is this is what you do. Yeah. Uh, uh, Subir, so 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 in the in the Yukawa SYK model, the 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 coupling between both and fermions should be uh, zero mean, right? I mean, it can be both positive and negative. Yeah. 
in the Yukawa SYK model I began with, that's correct. But uh, but in this model, no, we don't need to have that. We have both. We have both G and G prime. Oh, okay. Oh, well, so, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's true that when we put in these indices here, this has zero mean again, but without the delta function of R. Uh, but I'm just viewing that as a trick. Okay, that's just a large end limit trick. Uh, it doesn't seem to make any difference whether you know the system. You are averaging this over zero value. That's correct. Once you put in all the indices, uh, but I believe it's still capturing the physics of the n equals one case where there is no fluctuation at all. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, that would be you know the only way to prove that is to do some corner Monte Carlo. Uh, but I mean we know already. I mean corner Monte Carlo in the pure model has already been done, and it you know it seems to be roughly consistent with this. Uh, with this omega to the two third behavior. Yeah. Hi, Sabir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So, do you have uh, predictions that could invalidate or validate the universal model? So, beyond linear T resistivity, is there something yeah. like a smoking gun or? Well, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, there's lots. I mean, look, okay. Uh, first of all, the, you know, the fact. I mean, the marginal Fermi liquid behavior is seen in the experiment uh, in the self energy, as uh, and all of these properties. Uh, and the you know people have said for a while that the conductivity has some strange exponent, uh, presumably misled by the omega to the two third in the theory. And now everyone seems to be coming around to the fact there is no strange exponent, uh, but only the log in the m star. Uh, and we didn't know that when we did this theory, so. <laughs> uh, so maybe that could be considered a prediction. Uh, but so the the data you were showing for the optical conductivity in the beginning experiments, does it match the form you're getting for sigma of omega in the large in the large end limit? Yeah, this, is, this is a very recent paper. It's not even you know. In fact, it was after our paper, if I remember right. Uh, yeah, this is a two two o five. Yeah, this is a real yeah. Analysis of, yeah. Um, I mean, it was going on for a while from Antoine's group. Um, but okay, but fair question, you know, what can we predict? So there's, there are measurements of, uh, uh, you know, low energy electron scattering by, uh, uh, by Peter Abomonte, um, EELS experiments of, and so we are doing calculations to fit those. Um, there are, uh, you know, measurements of short noise by Doug Natelson, and so we are doing calculations to see how that worked. That, that was just, again, very recent measurements. Uh, you know, uh, let's see. This, so what we don't understand yet, I think I would say, is the magnetotransport, uh, the linear H dependence. In, well, in certain very disordered models, we can understand it, but I don't think we have a clean understanding of it. So the I mean, this is a field where there's much more data than this theory. So it's hard to make a prediction because everything you can imagine has been measured. <laughs> and so far, everything that we can compute does, you know, seems to work. So, but we keep trying. And then uh, uh, there's, yeah, so I mentioned short noise, uh, there's density fluctuations, there's optical conductivity. Uh, of course, we know someday we want to compute TC, but we're a long way from that. <laughs> but do you believe that this pseudo-block physics is tied to this random like interaction or it's a separate, the pseudo-gap? Oh, the pseudo-gap. Uh, no, that's a separate issue entirely. That's, uh, that, you know, I don't think randomness is important for the pseudo-gap, no. Uh, but the autoparam, the what you choose for phi is very much connected to the nature of the pseudo-gap. So, you know, Say in the uh, in the Nick tides, I think there's everyone would agree it's either spin density wave or some nematic order, and to the extent there's a pseudo gap that's related to fluctuating uh, fluctuation of antiferromagnetism, uh, that may well be true also for the electron doped cube rates. For the whole doped cube rates, I suspect the pseudo gap has to do with some spin liquid physics, uh, and that will connect up to this theory in the fact that this phi field should be some kind of uh, uh, boson, hybridization boson, uh, associated with the fractionization and the pseudo gap regime. Uh, so, so in that sense, there's a connection exactly what you choose for a phi. But then, you know, the beauty of the, this theory it doesn't really matter what you choose for a phi as far as the strange metal is concerned. That has a uh, so short answer the pseudo gap is very material specific and depends on the details. 
uh, but the strange metal is not. It seems to be really very robust. Uh, yeah, so we, I have a whole long list of things you're computing. Uh, I, was trying to, I think I forgot something, but we, yes, we are trying uh, to, you know, I think the the biggest thing we want to make progress on is really understand in this theory, for example, without any indices, uh, you know, what's the microscopic value of G prime? What determines it? What's the microscopic value of V? And how does that influence? And also G then, naturally. Uh, and uh, so as we understand this theory in more quantitative detail, hopefully with computer work, uh, I think we can make progress on these questions. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's a theory. This theory has been around for so long and, and, and it's uh, it's really quite enlightening how once you make put in this little bit of randomness here, it suddenly falls into place. <laughs>